If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. On Horse Chats today, I'd like to welcome back Catherine Silver. Now, Catherine has been here before. In her previous chat, which is number 759, she talked about using dressage to complement Western training. And I think it's great, you know, that we can do the cross-training workhorses between disciplines. And Catherine's dressage background has certainly helped her within her um, Western training as well. But before we welcome Catherine, I just want to remind you that this podcast is brought to you by International Horse College. Now, horse welfare and safety are of utmost importance to us at International Horse College, which is why we've included them in our value statements. Within our wide variety of horse courses, we utilise methods that promote safe and humane methods of interaction between horses and humans, supporting only safe and educating riders, handlers and trainers about horse welfare. Have a look now at the online courses at internationalhorsecollege.com, registered training organisation number 31352. Now, Catherine, I'd like to welcome you back. How are you? I'm great. How are you, Glennis? Good to be back. I'm looking forward to talking to you today because, you know, a lot of the time we talk about horses, we talk about interaction, but when we're riding the horses, we're generally talking about training and you're now going to talk about whether or not your horse's training is going in the right direction. Because every time we ride them, every time we interact them, every time we do something to them, we're training them. Now, we might be training what not to do or what to do that we don't want them to do, but we really want them to be going in the right direction to get a great communication with us so that they become just a pleasure to be around and hopefully we become a pleasure for them as well. Yeah, that would be my wishful thinking. Yes, I would like to think that they enjoy their work. Yes, yes. Now, I know that you do dressage in Western. Is this particularly for a dressage horse, particularly for a Western horse, or particularly for every horse? No, this is for any horse and any rider. And I work with a lot of you know, adult amateur people who you know, buy their horse when they're you know, in their 40s, in their 50s. It's a lifelong dream for them. They've never... Um, yeah, you know, done this before, and then they're 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 entering this this uh, huge forest, this maze of information that's out there from all the 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 books and all the um, all the the videos that are on YouTube and all the podcasts and and all those things, and and people are wondering, well, how how can I tell which information is correct and what you know if I'm working with my horse, how can I tell whether this is doing something good for my horse? So that is uh, how I came up with this idea that there are ways where you can't, your horse will tell you. And we've got the 10 points. So you've sent me the 10 points, but I'm going to ask you to explain them more because I know you. the first one is your horse becomes more beautiful. Now, if you've got a horse, you, you know, you just think your horse is the most beautiful anyway, but I've seen quite a few horses that pretty much look like donkeys, like they don't look particularly good and not particularly good confirmation. And then all of a sudden, you see them ridden and you go, oh, where did that horse come from? You know, so the fact that you've said your horse becomes more beautiful, tell me a little bit more about that. I mean, I've seen it, but I want you to explain to people in your own words just what we actually mean by that. Yeah, so one of the biggest compliments I've ever gotten um, is, uh, you know, the, the, the was on a horse that, you know, had, you know, pretty, uh, you know, non-desirable conformation, like a very upside-down neck and a very long back and, and, uh, and just, you know, and, and a very downhill build, and, and nobody ever thought that that horse was beautiful, uh, and his head was too big for his neck, and, and so then, you know, six months later, or I think it was more than that, it was like a year later, after I had been working with that horse every day for that amount of time, and that horse was really coming along. Uh, somebody who had seen the horse when he arrived said, is that, the, oh my God, is that the same horse? Like that horse was unrecognizable. Um, and all of a sudden people were commenting, oh, this is a good looking horse. This is a very handsome horse. And so I thought, well, I, I must be doing something right here. Um, so yes, so that is something that happens. Of course, it doesn't happen in, in a week. It doesn't happen in a month. It takes a long time, but it is something to watch out for. 
Um, so what happens with correct training is the horse builds uh, muscles over the top line. The horse's uh, um, you know, neck fills out right in front of the withers instead of right behind the ears where they, they get that big bulge if they just brace against the bit. Um, and also, you know, I have all those clients who said, oh, should I put my horse in this supplement or that supplement? And, oh, this is it will make my horse's coat shiny. This is it will make my, my horse's, you know, uh, the, my horse healthier. This is what will make my horse look really good. I said, but the best thing you can do for your horse to make him look good is um, do the right work. Because then all of a sudden there's muscles in all the right places and their, their coat looks shiny because they have the muscles uh, under the skin. And it just, the horse just looks better. They just look like athletes. It's like the difference between, you know, in, in humans too, when you have somebody who works out regularly and all of a sudden you're like, oh, you're a very good looking person. So yeah, it applies to us too. I love it. I love it. You know, that correct training will make him look more handsome over time. Love that. Love that. Oh, but it's so true. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm just thinking, you know, that we're talking about the horse willing to stretch forward and down in all three gates. So we talk about the walk, trot and canter. So a horse stretching forward and down, just explain that a little bit more because, you know, a horse can have his nose on the ground but not really be stretching correctly. So tell us a little bit more about what you mean by the horse willing to stretch forward and down in all three gates. Uh, yeah, so that's you know, one of the big things that I work on in um, all of my young horses and all of the horses that I get that have had incorrect training in the past is to get them to stretch forward and down. So that means that they step under themselves, you know, and, uh, you know, and make their back longer and their neck longer and their neck kind of periscopes down and out in front. And it's almost like they're searching for the contact and they're searching for the bit. And it's a very pleasant feeling. They're not yanking their nose down. They're not just diving down. Uh, they're not just, you know, uh, traveling with their hind legs out behind them. They're stepping forward and they're actively, uh, you know, you can feel their back lift. I guess that is the key point. Uh, you know, you can feel their, their back come up to, to, to greet my back. And then the neck, you know, comes down in this very soft and undulating way. And then you can pick them up again from there and everything is better. So I do this a lot, not just at the end of a ride as a reward, but I do this you know, intermittently um, at the walk, at the trot, and, you know, and later too at the canter because I feel that you know, if a horse is not willing to stretch down, then there's something a little bit off. So I want to check for that a lot. And I love that because it's the communication. You know, you talk about the horse's back coming up to greet the rider's back and the horse searching for the contact. So the horse is really looking to be ridden that way and giving almost directions to the rider. This is the way that I like to go. I like to go this way, which is the you know correct way. Yeah, and of yeah. course they can't go around down there indefinitely. You have to eventually, uh, yeah, they have to lift the forehand and, and, and go come up into a working frame. But if you lose that willingness to stretch, and if you know, it, it, that's, that's a really huge alarming sign that there is something wrong and, and you need to get it back. Um, and so, yeah, and I love what you said about the, the, the horse you know, communicating that they like to be ridden that way because that's how I feel. Once you teach them to do that, they want to do that, and then you can use it as a reward and use it a lot. It's better than a treat. It's, uh, yeah, in fact, it's much better. The horse says, oh, I get to stretch. Oh, that is so much fun. Okay, let's go for it. Tell us then about riding the horse on contact. So you can ride your horse on contact. You don't have to. But tell us a little bit more about riding contact and why you don't have to. Yeah. So uh, contact is uh, one of those concepts that dressage riders think that they have all figured out, but some of them don't. And uh, Western riders and endurance riders are scared of it. And they think that contact is the devil. And I think the truth is somewhere in the middle. If the contact is good, you don't have to be on contact 100% of the time. So if I have a horse and the horse has been, you know, trained in dressage and, and uh, you know, I, I can't take the horse on a trail ride and just drop the reins at the walk or like a nice relaxed trot, then to me that contact wasn't really correct. Then the horse is, is you know, you always have to hold the horse back. You can never, uh, the horse completely falls apart without the rein contact. So that to me is, is not right. Then if you have a horse, uh, like I sometimes get a, a, a Western horse that's not really been ridden correctly or an endurance horse that's never heard of contact, then, of course, there's also something wrong about that because then a lot of times the horse is crooked and the horse is uh, um, not worried. The horse is stuck and, and the horse is, is tense and you can't really help the horse relax because they, they, they don't know about contact. So um, contact means that uh, the horse stretches over the back into a softly receiving hand. 
Um, and then um, you can also give that contact up for a few strides. It's the German word uh, you know, for that is Überstreichen, which really, uh, you know, that doesn't really exist in English, the stroking over the release of the reins, the inside rein or both reins. And so I do that a lot without changing anything else. I just give the rein and the horse is, oh, okay, I, I can carry myself, that's fine. Um, but, uh, yeah, if the horse has to be um, on a tight rein all the time and doesn't know how to go any other way, that is, uh, you know, that is not how we want the contact to be. Well, it's not, it's not just that. If the horse is on a tight rein all the time, not very enjoyable for the rider. The rider wants to feel like they're enjoying the ride and the horse enjoys the ride. Yeah, yeah, and you shouldn't always feel like, oh, I have to contain my horse, otherwise he'll explode. I mean, that that's very unpleasant. I've ridden a lot of horses like that. If we train horses like that, it, it just doesn't feel good to the horse or to me or to anybody. Yeah, yeah. All right, now transitions. You know, we've talked about the walk trot canter. How should the transitions go? I mean, ob- obviously, they should be smooth and effortless, but how can we get them? Um, well, that's also when the contact improves through a lot of stretching forward and down and getting picked back up and through uh, some, some uh, leg yields and lateral work maybe and, and uh, the softening, uh, then the transition should become more uh, and, and also the strengthening work. The, the horse's hindquarters become stronger um, and more able to carry the rider and uh, you know, the horse becomes more supple and uh, the horse understands this whole process better. So then transitions look like you know, they don't cost the horse any effort at all. If the horse, a green horse, a lot of times you pick up a canter and the horse kind of lurches into the canter, and yeah, and and that's okay for the you know for, you know for a very green horse. But you know over time the transition should look like they're not a big deal. So anybody, any uneducated person watching should say, oh, that that was easy. That didn't look like it was a lot of work for the rider or for the horse. I love the way you've done this. You've sort of almost done like a checklist. You know, is my horse's training going in the right direction? If I look at these ten points. Is this getting better and better? And I love this. I love the way that even in the first one, you talked about the horse being an athlete, okay? So obviously the horse's fitness is going to increase, okay? So as the horse's fitness increases, tell us a little bit more about what happens there. Well, that's something that I find with dressage horses and some uh, you know, recreational trail riding horses. That's something that's neglected a lot. Horses are athletes, and you know, I'm an athlete too. I'm an ultra marathon runner, so I know about that. Um, you know, fitness is important. So if your horse can't canter a full circle, and 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 you know, my my student says, "Oh, my horse has to take a break because he's exhausted," or I can see that the horse is exhausted after twenty minutes. I say, "Well, there is something a little bit off in your training." So correct training means that the horse can work for an hour, and yeah, with you know, with occasional walk breaks, of course. But you know, still, the the, the horse isn't you know utterly exhausted. You know, when you get off every time. And so that means that, uh, yeah, you work with your horse, you know, pretty much every day and you alternate hard days and easy days and you cross train, but, you, you know, your horse is an athlete and you have to treat your horse like an athlete. Yes, yes, yes. I suppose the same things with people because we talked earlier on, you know, that contact's there all the time and you just feel like the horse is just leaning and leaning and leaning. The rider shouldn't be physically tired either. So when we get off the horse, you know, we should feel like we're an athlete and we're not physically tired. But is that also the way the horse is going? Tell us a little bit about that, the fact that we don't okay, want to so, be physically yeah, tired. That, I think I, I, look, uh, yeah, I look at that now. And yeah, so my point number six is you, you, know, the, um, you are not physically tired every time you get off your horse. Um, so, of course, you know, I have to clarify that a little bit. Uh, riders are athletes, too. So, of course, you know, if you are totally unfit, then you will be physically tired when you get off your horse because it is a sport. And certain muscles engage and disengage and and, and you have to move with your horse. And it's not like, you know, my husband likes to say we both have the sitting down jobs where he sits at his desk and I sit uh, on a horse. And and, I I think he knows that it's not really like that. But, however, um, if you are exhausted when you get off your horse, if your arms are tired, that probably means your contact was too strong. If you were hanging on your horse and your horse was hanging on you and your arms are exhausted, that's you know, a sign of, you know, that's not, um, you know, it, it shouldn't be like that. As your training progresses, your contact should get lighter and, and you shouldn't be so tired. The same thing in, in dressage too. When riders are always, you know, engaging their core and they, they, they say, oh, it's so important to have a strong core. Yeah, it's important to have a strong core, but you sh- it shouldn't be this this um, really exhausting core workout to ride your horse. You shouldn't have to push and shove with your core every stride. That's not what this is all about. As your horse gets more you know, in tune with you and, and, and becomes a better partner, your horse should read lighter signals. And riding should be less of a physical effort as time goes on. 
Yeah. So really, we're working at the horse being, you know, if we're not physically tired, the horse is going well, the horse is responding well, his paces are going well. It means that you're really building that partnership, aren't we? Yeah, and there is an um, there is a mental part to uh, you, know, uh, you know getting uh, being tired every time you get off your horse. I know people who spend a lot of time arguing with their horse, nagging their horse, fighting with their horse, uh, you know, and, and just having unpleasant conversations with the horse. And they're you know mentally and emotionally fatigued when they get off, and they say, "Oh, you know, it's like he's you know he's not understanding me, he's not responding." And and that's also yeah, you know, that's. Uh, if your training is going in the right direction, and yeah, of course there will be disagreements with your horse, but yeah, you know, there should be a majority of the time where it's pleasant for both of you. Mm, mm, so if you mm. get off your horse and you're exhausted, you know, if, <laughs> yeah, there are going to be rights like that if you're a professional trainer, but it shouldn't be the norm. And as time goes by, it should happen less and less. Okay. Now we talked before about the horse being more beautiful. Anyway, they're more beautiful because they look good just standing there. They look like an athlete. But we're talking now about the paces and the horse should be easier to sit to. So tell us a bit about what's going to happen. I mean, you know, we're not looking at training the horse. We're looking at whether or not the horse's training is going in the right direction. And we're looking at these almost like a bit of a checklist. So tell us about the gates, how they become more beautiful, why they would become more beautiful and why the horse would be easier to sit if the training is going in the right direction. Uh, yeah, so um, over time, as your horse develops as a balanced and supple athlete, then yeah, he will uh, be easier to sit and more pleasant to ride. And that also goes to where it's less physically exhausting to ride because he learns to be, develop those muscles over his top line. He learns to be, become more laterally supple and his back then starts to swing. And then it's much easier for um, your back to engage with you know, his back and you know, for the two backs to start talking to each other. And so, uh, you know, the, the, the movement becomes more cadence and more rhythmic, you know, through a lot of transitions and through a lot of stretching and going back up and all the things that we've already mentioned. Um, so um, if, you know, his trot feels like it'll rattle the feelings out of your teeth, that's a sign that, you know, maybe you're training, you know, like, even if you're schooling all the movements of, of second or third level or whatever, um, there is something a little off. Um, it should not be that, that uh, you know, the, the gates become harder to sit. You know, even a big extended trot should feel easy. Yeah, it's, it's not the easiest thing in the world to sit, but it shouldn't feel unpleasant. It shouldn't be jarring. It should be like a big ocean wave. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. Now, we always talk about happy horses. We always want our horses to be happy. But some of the things that we do to make a horses happy, you know, and I know that, you know, give them a carrot and in the moment they're happy. But horses being happy, what's the sort of things, you know, we don't want them swishing their tail, pinning their ears. How is it that um, as we progress through the training, the horse looks happy. Tell us a little bit about that, what we should be looking for. Well, yeah, so we, we should um, be, be looking for a soft eye. We should be like looking for a relaxed swinging tail. We should be looking for a facial expression. And horses really have facial expressions. I mean, when they have those worried wrinkles uh, you know, around their eyes or you know, around their nostrils, I mean, you can just tell that there's tension. They give hold their jaw if they, they you know, a lot of times, you know, horses they, you know, grind their teeth or you know, there's tension there. I mean, there's a lot of signs that, that, that there is you know, when they're not happy. So when they are happy that the, you know, the tail swings, the back swings, the their breathing is huge. That's something I really watch for when I when I work with the horse and they start to hold their breath. Uh, that is, yeah, you know, I need to back off. I need to work on relaxation again because you know the horse can't learn when they're uh, you know, when they're not relaxed. So when they take a deep breath from the diaphragm, then I know okay now we're on to something good, and that's the sign of a happy horse. So we've got to be very aware of you know when the horse is happy. And again, there's going to be moments of tension and moments of disagreement. If you know, the horse says, oh, I want to go back to the barn. And then and you say, well, no, we're going to be here for a little while longer. And or, you know, the, horse, the horse will be tense and unhappy, but it should be for a moment. The horse should then be able to refocus and say, okay. And uh, that is what, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not worried if there's a moment of unhappiness, if there's one tail swish, but it shouldn't last the entire ride. It shouldn't happen every ride. It shouldn't be the norm. Yep. Yep, yep. Now, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about something that's natural because we're right and left-handed. You don't get many people that are equally right and left. Tell us about horses. You know, how do we know to do with their right side and their left side? How do we know that the training is progressing in the right direction? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so point number nine is if, you know, 
uh, you know your training is going well if you don't feel like you're riding two completely different horses depending on whether you're going left or right. And that is, yeah, yeah. And, the, <laughs> and horses are, you know, a lot of them are extremely right-handed or extremely left-handed. And, you know, when I start a, a young horse, it's, I mean, it's from day one. Uh, and then, of course, if the rider is crooked, that's, you know, that you can make it worse uh, or you can compensate for, you know, the horse can compensate for you or you can compensate for the horse. I mean, that's a different topic for, for another chat. But um, uh, over time, as your training progresses and as you do uh, slightly more work to the stiff side and slightly, uh, you know, uh, no, actually, uh, the, the, the hollow side becomes um, harder to deal with over time and, and uh, straightening the hollow side is more difficult in the end than, than suppling the, 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 um, the stiffer side. But the goal is to have a horse that feels the same right to left. And when you're switching directions, you know, you should feel like you're on the same horse. And that is an ongoing process. And I find that, you know, no matter how advanced the horses are, it's never truly over. Because, you know, I'm crooked too, and most riders are, and we have our little idiosyncrasies in our bodies. And then the horse, you know, uh, has you know, little little moments of crookedness creep in, and you always have to watch for that. But you're really doing the horse a big favor by making them even-sided. And as far as, like, long-term health and soundness goes, it's, it's really, I think, you know, the horses that... Uh, that are are not even out that way in gymnasticide left and right, and uh, they are the ones who eventually break down on the on this side that they're taking too much weight on. Mm-hmm. I've seen this. Okay. Now, one thing that you have mentioned here, it's actually the last point, the horse's comfort zone becomes larger. Can you just explain a little bit what you mean by the comfort zone and how it would become larger if your training was progressing in the correct direction, the right direction? Well, when I start a horse, so when I retrain a horse and they, I don't trust the horse, the horse doesn't know or trust me, well, then, you know, I, I like to start in my nice, uh, you know, round pen with a you know, solid wooden size. I mean, it's a great place to, you know, eliminate all distractions and just get the horse to focus completely on me and really figure each other out. And so, um, and then from there, I usually go to, you know, my indoor arena, which is also very contained. It's not huge. Um, I try to work such horses when there's not much going on, when there's not much traffic around the barn, when there's not much clanging and banging happening or or big orange tractors moving about. Um, And so, you know, those are all things that, you know, on a green horse uh, where there's no trust established yet, then that is a good thing to do. Uh, But the the crucial point here is uh, once the horse uh, trusts me and I trust the horse, then progressively uh, we our comfort zone becomes larger. And that's, you know, in a physical sense where we ride in more um, areas where I take the horse out on the trail, where I, I cross the road with the horse. I take the horse out to my trail obstacles and, and, and uh, you know, introduce some of those. And that's always a, a good way of making the comfort zone larger. Um, I don't eliminate distractions. I say, oh, no, go ahead, work that tractor next to the arena. It's going to be fine. He can deal with it. Um, and so that is, you know, if the physical comfort zone becomes larger, also other horses in the arena, if the horse is scared of, of other horses, well, then I don't tell the other horses, like, well, you can't ride your horse right now. I'm working my horse. Uh, but I'm like, no, no, my horse will, my horse will learn. My horse will deal. My horse, you know, this is a way of, of making my horse uh, more trusting and more focused. And so these are distractions really do become training opportunities if you look at them that way. But then the comfort zone also uh, you know, uh, applies to other things like new movements and new skills. Like if you have a horse that's never, you know, gone over a cavalletti before and you introduce it, you know, a horse that really trusts me will not be scared, you know, uh, out of his head. They will say, oh, well, what's this? Okay, well, usually when you introduce something, I, it's a good idea. So I think I'm going to give it a try. And so that's, uh, yeah, you can take your horse to a show. You can take your horse to a clinic. And it's not like your horse will be perfect or exactly like at home, but you can still talk to your horse and your horse will still check in with you. Yeah, I I love the way I think right through this, we've talked about just signs that are showing, you know, and as I said, a signs checklist to see if your horse's training is going in the right direction. But you're really building a partnership. You know, it's a long process, but I think you're doing a great job with it. If people would like to know more, I'm looking at your katrinsilverdressage.com. Is that the best way to contact you to find out a little bit more about this? Yeah, there's uh, some information on my website. Um, there's my blog on my website. A lot of the, the uh, topics near and dear to my heart are on my blog. So you can just scroll through there and see if there's something that you know interests you. And also you can find me on Facebook. Uh, Catherine Silver Dressage has a Facebook page. Uh, so you're welcome to follow me there. I have an Instagram account, but I'm never on it, so don't do that. Don't do Twitter either. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> Look, you know, sometimes people come along and say, oh, yeah, but 
my horse is a bit different. It's not quite like that. I, I love all these signs, but I've got problems in different areas. I think we're going to get you back on, Katrine, and um, let's talk a little bit about things that are, I suppose, red flags the next time you come on. You know, we've talked about the ideal and we've talked about this is what should happen, but then we want to know, yeah. you know, about what shouldn't happen yeah. almost. And these, yeah. these 10 signs, these ten signs if, you, if you look for any of those signs, like a deep breath or like a, a horse that all of a sudden, uh, you know, bends better to one side uh, than to the other or a horse that becomes easier to sit or a horse that's stretching down there. These are all signs where you can, as a rider, you can give yourself a big pat on the back because it means you're doing something right. And, you know, riders, we tend to be very hard on ourselves and we tend to be very critical. But I think it's important to also to recognize, okay, so this means that something is going right. So that's really what uh, I encourage you to look for. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. All right, look, as always, great talking to you and uh, looking forward to talking to you again. And I think, you know, as we said, if you want to go to katrinsilverdressage.com or just go to horsechats.com and uh, search for Katrin, K-A-T-R-I-N, or search for Silver, S-I-L-V-A, and you'll find the um, contact details at the bottom of Katrin's page. So thanks again for coming on, Katrin, and we'll talk to you very soon. Thank you so much, Janet. If you've enjoyed this chat, then please comment, rate, and subscribe. If you'd like any changes or recommendations for guests, then please contact us through horsechats.com. And while you're online, have a look at the government accredited courses at internationalhorsecollege.com. Registered Training Organisation 31352. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below 